company that we've got here today is uh, a fairly mixed bag, which is pretty representative of the Jacobite army in 1745. We've got uh, a range of different types of weaponry, a range of different styles uh, of dress, uh, and they are representative of the types of men who fought in 1745. And unsurprisingly for where we are, most of the men here are in Highland dress, uh, and you can see uh, that that is most commonly represented by the men who are wearing the Fillymore, the great plaid, uh, the belted plaid, uh, pleated and belted around their waist, uh, creating the, the kilt at the front and all that extra material hanging down at the back which can be pulled up around and over the shoulders and head if the weather were to turn. Uh, so a very versatile all-weather garment uh, and uh, the, the, the sort of, uh, of clothing you would see most commonly uh, in these parts. In a very uh, distinct range of colours uh, and colour was very important. Highlanders uh, were peacocks in the sense that the brighter the colours you wore, the more colours you wore uh, the, uh, the higher your status, uh, which is why, for example, you can compare directly this Alistair uh, with our friend Angus here, uh, and the two give you a perfect contrast in terms of the social scales uh, of Highland dress and how that is reflected in the Jacobite army. Because you see that Alistair, uh, who is simply dressed in uh, relatively uh, unexpensive clothing, uh, with uh, darker colours, muted colours, uh, no uh, really expensive bright dyes. You can see on his feet uh, he's got uh, very simple uh, Highland brogues and he's equipped with a musket, a Spanish musket, which has been given to him by the Jacobite army uh, which has been importing arms from the continent. Uh, so it's not one that he owns personally. Other than that he has no weaponry. Angus, by contrast, is the regiment Piper uh, and therefore a man of status within the unit and that is reflected in the quality of his clothing, everything tailor-made, uh, brighter colours uh, and you can see also that he's wearing three different tartan sets uh, because uh, that was uh, considered to be perfectly fashionable uh, and uh, a mark of good taste to have all of those uh, bold, proud colours. So the, uh, the other point, of course, is that Angus is better equipped. He has uh, a, an expensive dirk, a very fine uh, broadsword there, uh, and uh, therefore is able to use firepower and, when it comes to it, uh, the, uh, the clash of steel as well. A Highland army that was being pulled together by Prince Charles at very short notice in 1745 needed to be able to combine the elements of modern warfare that were battle winners, firepower and discipline with the aggression and the hand-to-hand -hand close quarters contact uh, that uh, the Highlanders themselves preferred. And so the training of the Jacobite army had to reflect that. You will notice that almost all of the soldiers have got access to a firearm. This is really important. This is not going to be some backward looking uh, old uh, medieval army we're pulling together out of the Highlands. This is a modern 18th century army which will have to stand toe to toe with a professional uh, paid and trained army like the British Redcoats. So we have to have firepower in order to go toe to toe with them and fight uh, on even terms, especially if we want to be taking fortified positions uh, like those around the Highlands. So that's really important. But what we also need to be able to do is combine that firepower and discipline with the aggression and speed of an attack. And so we need to be able to move from, uh, from firing positions in lines to uh, aggressive charging tactics. Uh, and you may, if the enemy decides to resist, encounter some of these tactics later on when we make our advance, don't tell anybody this, mind you, uh, against the red coat camp. Now, uh, the three gentlemen here are dressed slightly differently, and you can see that these are in fact uh, dressed uh, in lowland style clothes. And so they have breeches and hosen, uh, waistcoats and jackets, uh, boots in one instance there. Notice uh, some of them have lace shoes, some have buckled shoes, the more expensive variety. And these lowlanders are also an essential part of the prince's army. Although the Jacobites wanted everybody to believe that every soldier they recruited was a terrifying Highlander, 
actually most of them by the uh, second half of the campaign were in fact lowlanders but in order to create a sense of un unified identity the prince has instructed even the lowlanders in the army to wear some elements of highland dress which is why at the very least you would expect them to wear uh, a sash of tartan or a tartan waistcoat or a tartan jacket and so you see the differences and you also see therefore that the men who are dressed in lowland styles are not dressed for a highland charge they don't have swords and targes ready to go into hand-to-hand -hand battle uh, they're much more expecting to fight in lines volley firing with their muskets i'll draw special attention to the gentleman at the end because you will note that uh, he has uh, a little bit of finery about him a gold laced hat and of course that uh, gold uh, emblem around his neck which is a gorget and those are, that is the symbol of his commission as an officer in the French army uh, so there were many especially amongst the, uh, the middling officers of the Jacobite army who were uh, Highlanders, Scotsmen who had seen service and still uh, were currently commissioned in the French army they were experienced soldiers therefore uh, and they came specifically back to Scotland during the course of the Rising to provide that military experience that the Jacobite army needed uh, and took place uh, usually with an increase in rank uh, in the Jacobite army as well. Uh, and so uh, what you see is a range of different men uh, all wearing their own clothes, uh, all uh, have, with varying levels of experience and differing expectations as to what the war will bring. What we're going to do is, uh, just for their benefit as much as anything else, is go through the firing process so that they are reminded as to how the muskets work. Some of these men would be holding their muskets for the first time uh, and would be uh, unaccustomed to using them. Uh, and then we will give you an idea uh, of uh, how a Highland charge might look as well. So, shoulder your firelock. Without powder, but in your own time, load. The muskets are brought round to the right hip and the, the pan is opened. Paper cartridge filled with gunpowder is opened by the teeth. The pan's primed with gunpowder. The rest of the gunpowder is poured down the barrel. You see them now with their ramrods pushing the, the paper of the cartridge and the gunpowder all to the bottom of the barrel and doing that, I must say, with remarkable efficiency. Slows them down a bit when they've got to use the powder, I must say. Now, the guns are loaded and they would be ready to fire. So if you come to the recover, and there would be three very simple orders. If you were watching the British Army give you this demonstration, they'd have taken a lot longer to do this because they like to do everything at the same time by beat of drum, nice and slow and disciplined. Uh, so for us, there are only three main instructions. Make ready. And that's the guns brought to full cock. Present. <laughs> and fire. Sorry, Matthew, you didn't survive your 18th birthday. <laughs> it was going so well. Sorry. <laughs> Recover. <going> well. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> You're not so good. <laughs> Shoulder your fire locks. <laughs> Every second man take one pace to the rear. That's you, Kevin. Close your order to the centre. Oh, centre of gravity. Okay. Smell. Okay. Without powder, load. On the battlefield, we're not going to form one flimsy open line. We would try to deploy on the battlefield in three lines, in fact. But for the sake of what we've got here, we'll try it in two. The men taking care, therefore, when they fire their guns to make sure uh, that uh, they uh, aren't uh, poking the eye out of the man next to them with their ramrods. They're coming up to the recover. Now, in order to present you with a single massed volley, both ranks would fire together. The rear rank firing over the shoulders of the rank in front. Make ready. Present. Fire. Oh, and now you market. see, although it's a, a shorter frontage, you can see there's a lot more guns in a concentrated area. Recover. 
and that means a lot more musket balls, lead balls whistling through the air in this compact space, making it much less likely that you're going to be able to run through it. Okay, now we will try our firing and advancing, which we will attempt to use later. Okay, open your order from the centre. Okay, remember how we did this yesterday. Front rank! Make ready! Present! Fire! Reload! Rear rank! Advance! Make ready! Present! Fire! Cover! And we'd use that sort of manoeuvre to try and gain space and move forwards across the battlefield. Front rank. Go to the left. In, in the gaps between the left. Advance. Make yep. ready. Present. Fire. Bang. Front rank. Recover. Retire. Shoulder your fire lock. Well, it's fairly uncommon that you would expect to use that sort of manoeuvre on a battlefield, uh, but uh, in loose skirmishing it can be very useful in terms of giving cover and protection to the men who are trying to reload uh, whilst you need to maintain uh, a presence of fire. The British Army will be using platoon fire, which means that their lines uh, through a very complex and disciplined process can maintain a steady amount of firepower. Uh, we uh, don't have the, the strength of the command and control structure in our forces just now uh, to attempt anything so complex. Section, three paces to the rear, march. Form your clan. If the firefight is not proving to be the successful way of breaking through, then the Jacobites will form these clusters. And you see that the whole unit is condensed, very closely packed, very tightly packed together. They will go from the extended line into these very, very tight clusters, usually formed uh, around the individual clans in the Highland regiments. So a single regiment could break up into two or three uh, of these large clumps. And you can see that those who don't have swords have turned their muskets around, ready to use the heavy uh, uh, brass uh, plated butt ends. Uh, those at the back are ready to reach forwards with the musket butts. Uh, and the uh, senior gentleman in the unit, the highest of the social class and therefore the best armed, is the one who forms at the centre. In this case, it's our Piper Angus. And those men at the front with their swords, their targes, and you can just see the blades of their dirks peering out from behind the shields, ready for the chop. And this is the formation that they will use to punch through the British Army, which forms in linear formations only three deep. And if you can hit them with sufficient amounts of momentum, you can simply force your way through that line, break it up, and then it becomes a hand-to-hand -hand fight in which the advantage lies with the men with swords, not the men with guns. So a charge like this would advance very steadily. It would move forwards uh, as a clustered block. And then as it got closer, it would gain its pace. Uh, and eventually uh, the order Claymore would be given and these men would fall forwards uh, at great speed uh, and uh, lay upon you. Trying to brush aside the bayonets of the enemy with the targes, catching the uh, enemy with the dirks and then bringing the swords down from high on the, on the end. And so you can imagine how disruptive that technique would be once it reached the enemy's lines. Reform your ranks and files. Cover your fire locks in your time. The Highland Army was very versatile. The problem, of course, at the initial stage of the war was that it was also very inexperienced. 
uh, and it took time for the Jacobite army to learn its trade uh, and uh, despite that it won a succession of successes uh, particularly uh, the Battle of Preston Pans in September 1745 when the army was only a month old and from that point on it increased in strength and capacity and at its peak the Jacobite army reached the, the numbers of about 10,000 uh, so it became a very considerable very capable fighting force uh, and of course uh, the ultimate tragedy that befell it on the fields at Culloden is in no way reflective of the inabilities of the soldiers uh, who fought on the moor that day. So hopefully that's given you an introduction to uh, what it is that you're seeing when you're seeing the Highlanders and the Lowlanders of the Jacobite forces here and hopefully also it means that if you do see us in action later on in the day uh, then you understand a little bit more uh, about the way that these soldiers uh, were operating. And if you are a little bit amused about how we can fire at each other uh, without taking large numbers of casualties, then I'll remind you that muskets are smoothbore weapons that are very uh, poor in terms of accuracy, especially in the hands of untrained men, but even uh, for uh, trained soldiers as well, which is why we try to fire in volleys rather than as individuals if we're in an open space so you can maximize the chances of hitting something. But actually in a firefight, unless you're at extreme close range, casualties do tend to be relatively light. Once we get stuck in with bayonet or sword or dirk, all of that can change very, very quickly. Thank you very much indeed. I need to choose two pickets who will be accompanying me to go and scout out the enemy's encampment. Any volunteers to accompany me on uh, scouting duties? Angus Alistair, is that you stepping forwards or no, backwards? No, I stumbled, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I will accompany you. Thank you, MC. Angus and Nick. Okay, the rest of you to your duties dismiss. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.